computer scientist is like trying to figure out exactly some interesting property about that rock paper scissors game. But. Um, so I, ha I have a bunch of slide decks that I normally show, but I, I decided to sort of issue that just in hopes that you guys are being highly interactive. Um, and if you're not, it means it's going to be terrible. So help me out. Um, but it, it was it's cool to see so many people here. Actually, I've been to a number of um, student student entrepreneurship clubs, and uh, this might actually be the largest. So congrats on all the other bunch of smart people. Um, so I, I just start by way of background, and then would love to talk to you guys anything about entrepreneurship, venture capital, innovation, the singularity. I'm a big fan. Um, so I started actually as a computer science major at Carnegie Mellon, and I ended up at Carnegie Mellon because my friends said. It's a cool school, and I'm going to go there to do art. Why don't you come to it? I'm like, oh, that sounds fun. Um, and ended up in comp sci. I'm like, thank God, because computer science is, you know, sort of important these days. Um, and from there, I went, I went pretty much into tech. And my path into tech was because I was a horrible nerd. So I was playing Magic the Gathering competitively for money in middle school. <laughs> yes. My mother had no idea how much money I was making, thousands of dollars a month, which for like an 11 year old is like not a bad income. Um, <laughs> But she told me I was wasting my life, and she read in the newspaper that these two guys had sold their company for $150 million. Why don't you go work there? And I'm like, oh, all right, a million sounds like more than thousands. So let's go check it out. It's computers. I like computers. Um, and I showed up wearing a, a suit and asked for an application. And they're like, this is not McDonald's, son. Like, we operate on resumes here. I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. So I went home, I wrote a resume, and I came back in the suit the next day. I, I assume the suit was critical. It's, it's not. You don't need to set up to work in tech. Um, and said so I'd like a job. And they put me through like eight hours of interviews. I think kind of on a lark, because like what kid shows up and you know, he's like 12 years old asking for a job. But I actually ended up getting an internship there. And it was lucky for me, because it was like hardcore uh, debugging companies. They're writing all sorts of really low-level debugging software. And so I got into doing that, and I was their youngest intern ever, and then uh, stuck around and befriended the founders. And so when I was in college, they started their next company doing debugging for networking software. I had no idea, you know, up from down at this point. But I'm like, yeah, let's, let's do that again. That was fun. Um, and so I interned with them, and I was graduating Carnegie Mellon. I had offers from, you know, Google and Microsoft and all these big guys who, like, threw money at the problem of hiring, you know, hopefully smart young kids. Um, and I was like, guys, I don't, I don't know if I can come work for you. Like, these guys are going to offer me, like, a yellow Mustang or something. And uh, they said, no, no, we had a better idea. Come work in the woods of Hollis, New Hampshire, which is like farmland. Um, come work here, but if you recruit four of your Carnegie Mellon buddies, you can lead the team. I'm like, wow, power hungry 22 year old leading a team. Hell yeah. So I recruited four Carnegie Mellon comp side grads to go work you know, near cows and grain in the woods of Hollis, New Hampshire on this startup. And it was actually really cool. We we're doing some really cool. Uh, really cool tech, and I had majored in programming language theory, so I know all about type systems and functional programming, and nobody in the industry knew this stuff, and there was like, a chance to apply it, and it's some really cool stuff. But after four years of toiling away on this this uh, debugging software for network protocols, I kind of like put my head above the cubicle, and I'm like, hey, are we actually selling any of this stuff? And they're like, no, not really. Nobody's, nobody's buying this. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Um, so lesson number one, right? It's not just about building things. You want to build things that people, people like. And so from there, I said, okay, well, I'm not gonna make, I'm not gonna make that mistake again. I'm not gonna be sort of below the cubicle, I'm gonna be above the cubicle, so I at least know what's going on. And I kind of want to do something that I can explain to my mother, because I didn't like four years of having nobody understanding what the hell I was working on. So I did some networking around with smart people, and I think, by the way, you're saying that like meeting people and networking is it's super important. Like, it's pretty much 99% of the work, I think. Um, not the actual work, but the other work. Uh, and so I met, I met these two other entrepreneurs who had you know, built a, uh, a medical um, hardware software company, sold it for a ton of money, and they were looking to bring in somebody sort of technical and young uh, to help build an animation product for kids. And I had actually grown up drawing, and my family's actually all up with myself, they're all artists, so I was like, oh, that's kind of cool, my mom didn't get that. Um, so we partnered up and we created this cool website with a horrible name called doink.com. Kids call it doink, it's inappropriate <laughs> for kids to call it that. And uh, we built this really, the, the vision was, this is like when YouTube was coming online, the vision was, you know, wow, you know, all this, all this content's going to move to the cloud, and probably all the content creation is going to happen in a web page, which seemed novel at the time, right? In the age of Google Docs, it seems obvious, but at the time it was still new. So we built this really cool site for kids, and we ended up signing up half a million kids, and they were creating tens of millions of pieces of artwork. Really cool. And I'm like, yeah, I get what's going on here. Uh, but we couldn't get anybody to buy it. Right, so like apparently kids don't have credit cards and they can't pay for you know art tools online, or at least not from us. So we failed at so many other things, and even though I could see the entire business at the time, I kind of knew exactly how big of a skill gap uh, I had left. 
So, you know, it's not enough to be able to build, it's not enough to be able to control every aspect. Like, you've got to be able to market, you've got to be able to sell, you've got to be able to finance, uh, raise money, you've got to be able to recruit a team. I failed miserably at trying to build a team there as well for so many reasons. And, you know, everybody who we failed to hire in hindsight was smarter than we were. So good for them. I hired one later on to, to show him he was wrong. But, um, so I learned a ton there. And so I said, okay, well, wait a second. I've got a ton to learn still. How about instead of learning uh, in a vacuum, why don't I go work with other smart people who are trying to do this and get paid uh, and learn from their mistakes? So that was like the big insight. So go work at startups is what I'm telling you. Um, and I did a bunch of consulting uh, on the tech side. So I worked with a startup here called Gobi. Uh, they're a Flybridge company that got acquired by Telenav. They were like a search engine for things to do. You end up in a new city, you didn't know what to do or where the dog park was to help you. Uh, I worked with Runkeeper when they were four guys in a, in a, in a living room. And that was a lot of fun. So, you know, re-architected the site top and bottom, worked on some of the user-facing features, the analytics, figuring out some of their social, social, you know, feature set and how to motivate users. And, you know, learned a ton and watched these guys raise money and grow a team and all that. And I go, okay, got it. And the one other lesson I had this entire time is people were trying to recruit me to come do their startup and, you know, have me fail with them again, uh, was how important team was. And this is why networking is so important. Um, and so I said, no, I'm not going to work with anybody else for at least a year until I meet the exact, you know, right type of entrepreneur, someone who's hungry, who has done it and failed. I wanted somebody who had already learned on somebody else's dime or failed on their own money uh, and not on my time and, you know, my money and it's my time. Uh, and on a big vision that's going to be interesting enough to keep me sustained. Um, and that's when I met my co-founder for Boundless, uh, Ariel Diaz. So he had started a, a, a pay-per-view video platform called Ucaster, where you could put up video and people could pay to watch it. It worked for high school sports and some MMA. It's like a really natural mix. Um, it ended up failing for a lot of reasons. I think it would work today, but it was too early at the time. Uh, and he wanted to do something in the world of education, which is something I'm really passionate about. And you know, the other kind of thread throughout all my uh, entrepreneurial activities is always learning more the next time around. Like if you're the smartest guy in the room or you think like you know everything, you're doing the wrong thing. So I was like, great, education, I'm gonna learn a ton. This guy's failed like I've failed. It's a big and exciting vision. I think we both have the skill set. He's, in the, you know, he, I like to categorize people by their superpowers. His superpower is winning, right? Like you can't play with him competitively and win. It just won't happen. So it's like, that'd be a good guy to have the CEO. So he and I partnered up and, and you know, we're trying to solve a problem you guys are probably familiar with, which is that college textbooks are stupid. Um, publishers that make them are stupid. Hopefully none of them or their children are in this room. Um, yeah, so, you know, look, you know you can learn anything online. Like, when you go to learn something, do you pull out the book first? You know, hell no, you search, right? So we kind of took that insight and found all this great, you know, online free content, repackaged it in textbooks or individual modules that students and teachers could use instead of going through the sort of traditional publishing system. So we really want to be this big disruptive force. And now we've got millions of people coming per month to the site reading and studying and learning the materials, doing quizzes and assignments and all that stuff. So very cool. And learned a lot more in during that experience. So we actually were able to raise capital up front on a PowerPoint deck, um, which is great. You can do that. I totally recommend it. Um, and I'll get into that in a minute. But uh, that allowed us to like kind of, you know, come to the fight punching. We had, we had fuel. We could hire people for the first time. Uh, so that was really exciting. And then, you know, put the product out in market, got a good team together, raised another eight million, so it was two million the first time, eight million dollars six months later for the Series A. Um, that's when Ben Rock got involved, they let our Series A. And uh, yeah, grew the, grew the company. And so I worked on that for close to four years and left uh, about a year and a half ago. So I had built the early, you know, internal content system, I built the student-facing product, I had helped recruit the engineering team to come build that, recruit engineering leadership because I'm a terrible manager, helped do product, helped do marketing, and then kind of like was that, that guy in the corner of the room going like, what do I do here now? Like, I don't really know what people need me for. Um, so uh, I was still on the board, so I still had the ability to control the company from a strategic level, or contribute from a strategic level. Um, so I decided to leave. And my plan was just to take a year off to help, uh, or to just travel the world and just sort of reset my brain and think of you know what might be next. Um, and I ended up, uh, Venrock said, hey, why don't you come do tech investment? And I'm like, that's stupid, finance is dumb. And, uh, you know, I told him that, so it was not a surprise. Um, and sorry to the finance major that I met earlier. Um, <laughs> so, so I spent the next three months helping startups, because that's cool, and I'm like living on my savings going, wait a second, I'm paying my own money to help other people's companies when I could be getting paid to do this and hopefully put cash into them to help them grow even bigger. So that's just like, all right, maybe VC does make sense. So I joined up there, I've been there about a year and a half now, 
looking at all sorts of different stuff. Um, so SaaS products, big data, uh, Bitcoin, I love blockchain. If there are any blockchain nerds here, we should talk. VR, drones, anything sort of sci-fi singularity related I'm into. But also stuff that businesses need to. Um, so that's sort of the path to now. And I, I, I am, I don't know, I'd like to say that I'm somewhat involved with the Boston startup ecosystem. So I don't know what topics you guys want to talk about or find interesting on sort of your path through entrepreneurship. Like what mystifies you or what is challenging or, or what the hidden secrets are that we don't tell you to keep you down. But I'd be happy to tell you just about anything. Or I can ramble. Aaron, what are what are three opportunities in Bitcoin that you want to see exist that don't exist already? What are three opportunities in Bitcoin that yeah, I want to, to see exist? Exactly. Or build your own new blockchain. So does everybody know Bitcoin and blockchain? Okay, like so so you know okay, so this is great. No, this is <laughs> hope you're not being sarcastic, because no, it's really cool. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> Bitcoin you've seen, if you bought it two years ago you'd all be rich and you wouldn't be in here. Um, you might still be. Northeast is great. I wouldn't be here. I don't know. Um, but anyway, so the big innovation in, in that Bitcoin had is actually the algorithm of the called blockchain. So this is a way for you to uh, achieve distributed consensus. So there's this old comp sci program, uh, problem known as the Byzantine general problem, which is you've got a bunch of parties that need to coordinate something to understand the state of the world. In that case, it's for attacking a village, but it could be like who owes what count balance, right? Um, and you don't trust different actors in the network because they could be bad. How do you achieve consensus? How do you achieve trust? So the al algorithm underneath Bitcoin called blockchain solved that. And it's this idea of this shared database. Everybody has a copy. There's a heartbeat. You trade transactions. You spend computing power to prove that you, the majority of the network power is good and a good actor. And that's how you gain trust. So what this is going to do is pretty interesting. Number one, the first killer app is uh, digital cash that's not backed by a government. It's not controlled by anybody. You can't have it confiscated. You can't have it stolen. Um, that's pretty cool. But there's other stuff coming too. So what I think is really interesting is that Bitcoin, uh, the blockchain and Bitcoin give you a way to meter out and sell um, fundamental computing resources uh, in a distributed, trustless fashion at a micro transaction level that's never happened before. So for instance, one of the coolest projects I've seen is called uh, Filecoin. And what, the, what this guy do, is doing, Quan, is he's uh, created his own Bitcoin-esque protocol um, that allows you to trade hard drive space uh, for Filecoin, or you can buy other people's hard drive space with dollars to Filecoin. And so you have Dropbox today, but you have empty space in your laptop that somebody else could be using. And so he's created this peer system, not unlike BitTorrent or Skype, that allows all the hard drives and everybody's laptops, everybody's computers to be tied together and create a very efficient marketplace. And that ought to drop the price on storage because now any actor who has storage can bring it online to this network. And Amazon's, you know, they don't have to make a lot of margin, but they try to make a little bit of margin, right? So, you know, it ought to drive the price of storage way down and give you this system that's sort of a fundamental piece of the internet. And that'll happen for bandwidth, that'll happen for storage. Uh, it'll happen for compute. I think it's pretty interesting. So I think you'll see a lot of like new basic computing fabric come up because of the Bitcoin innovation. So I want to see those bandwidth, storage, compute. Sorry, get all technical. Portland. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Anybody? Okay. So one of my questions was, um, what are some of the lessons learned? <laughs> from building teams that failed. Oh, awesome. That's great. Um, building, so there, there's the, and stuff that I don't know if it's obvious to you guys yet, because I've like had it bounce around my head and you'll see it on the, the Twitter sphere, but there's, there's the notion of founder market fit, which I truly believe. So remember that startup I told you we're making uh, software for kids and my co-founders had made a medical device hardware company before like that? Sorry, that's not good, like founder market fit. Like these guys were brilliant, smart, smart people. Had no idea the challenges of marketing to children. We had no idea, I mean, this includes myself, no idea about uh, the sort of UI, UX considerations that, you know, as an adult, I might think is like super slick and so cool and like my Apple friends are gonna drool over, but like a six to 12 year old is gonna be like, why didn't you just put a big cartoon dog here? Like that would have made more sense. So like, <laughs> It would have made more sense, right? So founder market fit is number one. Um, and I think that when you're choosing when you're choosing the market for yourself and you're considering partners, put that number one. The second one is find people who are super, superlative, 
right? So I mentioned my superpower rubric. Like any entrepreneur I meet, I try to say, okay, if they were a superhero, which one would they be, right? Can they teleport through walls? Can they, you know, like Ariel never loses? That sort of thing. Um, you want to know what sets somebody apart because I think fundamentally startups are about having an unfair advantage that you just double down on over and over and over and beat your competition to a pulp. And I think that starts from the founders. Like you, you've really got to have that edge in something. So, you know, I, I'm not, of all the technical people I've worked with, I actually feel sort of like the least technical these days. Not, not just because I'm in finance now, but um, there's some really smart tech people out there. But my, my gift was, at the time, at least with recruiting, you could argue we could suck at it, but I had a good time with it. So that was my sort of superlative thing, and Ariel's was winning. He would just bust down any wall to get any deal done, get anything out the door, whatever it had to happen. So founder market fit, superlative person, it is a marriage. So you want somebody that's complementary um, in a lot of ways, but also shares a lot of your same core values. That's so true. And the third one is legal alignment. Um, and this isn't just like, a lot of people think that when you start talking like documents and equity and all that legal stuff, you know, you're like, it shows some sign of distrust. I actually, like I've come around on this in a big way. I used to think that, right? Like, you know, we don't need, we don't need to pay the lawyers. I'm like, you know, like, it's like a signal that I think you're gonna screw me. It's actually, I think it's, it's, like, it's like getting married. It's like saying like, yes, I do trust you and we're gonna put that in the paper and we're gonna do that. Do not skip that step. And I think that like, why I've come to like finance and lawyers and all that now is because what, you know, you guys are building your products, you're trying to change the world, you're trying to shape the future, great, you do that. And these services, finance, law, they are about helping align motivations and incentives and these guys are very, very skilled at that, right? So. Once you start building a startup and it's you know just you, fine, but it's you and a buddy, it's you and another buddy, it's you and employees, it's you and investors, it's you and customers, you start having a lot of different interests and managing a complex set of sort of incentives and motivations is really hard. So don't skip on that piece too. And like understand it and everybody should invest and all that stuff. You can read about that, but those are sort of the, the, four, the four things that identify as being pretty important. You, you figure out the words for your question yet? Okay, let's say you're not a business major. How do you go about learning the business skills without changing your major? Yeah, I'm actually I'm actually reading um, a personal MBA book right now because I don't have the, the business major either. Um, so I think that, 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 you know, if you think about, get really good at funnels, that's the first thing I'll say, right? Do you guys all know about like funnels, top to bottom, right? Like, so you like, you have a bunch of, uh, you know, unqualified leads and you've got leads and you've got, you know, I don't know if it's actually I don't know the sales terms here at all, qualified leads, prospects and blah, 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 and you've got, you know, accounts and sales and you close it, like, whatever. I don't know the sales side of things. I know it from the web side of things, right? You've got visitors, you've got people who interact, you've got people who register, you've got people who subscribe, you've got people who are longtime customers or for others or they might churn out. Well, fundamentally, all, everything is just this, this funnel, right? Everything's a tube, right? You're just shoving in people at one end and hoping they become customers on the other end. And so when you think about business, you're pretty much just, you know, there are like five things that underpin this tube that you need to be aware of. Are there enough people out there to make this matter, right? Are they willing to pay for the service? Can you provide the service cheap enough that you can keep a profit and keep operating and hopefully grow, right? It's, it's just not that hard. I think the reason you'd go to business school is to learn a little bit of all these different skill sets and do a lot of case studies so that you are armed with a bunch of pattern matching. Oh, when I see this, do this. I, as a builder, I think the best way to learn is by doing. So, you know, one thing I used to do a lot of with, uh, well, I've a couple of my buddies, but, but one in particular is we would get together one weekend every month and we would try to launch a business. And the goal was only to make a couple thousand dollars. If we made a couple hundred, I'd be happy, but do that, right? Like if you can figure out how to like profitably convert, you know, uh, Google search traffic into a sale, like you've done more than most entrepreneurs ever have, right? Like legitimately, and it sounds dumb, it's just a question of, is there, are there enough people out there that you can grow that? So I think you learn a lot by doing. You should read every business book out there that's in the top 100 anyway, like that stuff's super interesting. I just don't think you need an MBA that will give you a certain set of tools and if you don't have anything superlative to fall back on, maybe you should you know, go get like the generalist uh, perspective on business. But maybe you're, are you an engineer, I don't know. Great, so like just, you know, what do you like about that? Go deep and when you find the market or the opportunity that matches your particular skill set in that and you know all your buddies who are ready to come build that particular type of robot with you, whatever it might be, right? Then you know you're way out ahead of the pack, and you can find someone to compliment you on the business side, right? But I think you again, I just think you learn a lot by doing. 
And if there are business majors here, I think I'm wrong, you can tell me. I like fighting. Yeah, that's okay. Please tell me you're the head of the business school. <laughs> no, no. But I have an evening MBA program. Uh, I would say that there is... I wish I had my MBA. I will say that. This comes from a place of deep jealousy. <laughs> no, I mean, it, I took a long time to go back to my MBA. Uh, I would say that there's a lot of different parts. Um, probably one of the major things is learn as much about supply chain as possible. So you're not like saying, okay, well, there's some, I know there's somebody over in China who could do this. I said, yeah, there's 4,000 people over in China. Who are you going to get the best deal from? Who's going to get it to you as quickly as possible? Yeah, or India. Yeah, or and, and all this totally depends on the domain that you're operating in. So I, you know, I've, I've only built software companies. I haven't touched a hardware company. And so supply chain in the software world is, you know, cloud computing in some sense, right? Software developers and cloud computing. There aren't as many considerations. It's much, much, much easier. And Supply chain is so challenging. We see startups all the time, you know, working to solve that, right? So there's um, a couple locally, Panjiva, they do like a Yelp review for different Chinese manufacturers uh, and logistics providers. There's Dragon Innovation, um, which is actually a really cool company. Um, Ex iRobot guy who spun out and has just a great relationship with China. He knows his people, and he offers uh, this liaison mediation service for hard would-be hardware startups to this super difficult problem that you know you'd rather not get mired you mired in early on, you need to later, right? So, yeah, I think it, it, a lot of it's domain dependent, right? So for you, I mean, if you're doing something hardware related, maybe that's where you can be sort of superlative on that, right? Or someone on your team can be. I'd also try to find something that I could break it down to different, different parts, you know, put everything together in Mexico, you know, have the design here. Yeah, and actually, and to be fair, like I, I, I dabbled in a little bit of business classes and like, that those sort of optimization problems and all that are super fun. Like my internet math geek loves that stuff. So, yeah. Thanks. Oh, there we go. This other side of the room. I, I have two questions. Okay. Okay. Um, um, so my first question is, uh, your advice for startups? Would you say that? It's as between leading the startup as a team or having a leader with a vision who is to hire people who could share that vision. Uh, would you say that would make a difference in the outcome of, of the business? So I didn't quite get the first option. Uh, the, the two ways that, it, that I would assume the startup could go is you could have one person with the idea who's the leader and has the vision to, to lead that idea forward. Uh, that versus working as a team Oh, got it. Um, so I think the role of the CEO is vision alignment, right? And so if the question is, do you, I mean, I have a bias here and it's gonna show very quickly. Do you want like so many chefs in the pot of the vision or do you want like a lead chef and a bunch of folks contributing? And ideally that lead chef is open to being wrong and will correct course. But the job of the CEO, I mean, the CEO has several jobs, you know, there's, it's, be the keeper of the vision, raise money so you can f keep the operation running, and hire smart people to actually get it done. Like those three things. If you do those three things and you suck at everything else, you're a great CEO by any standard, right? I mean, don't break the law. Um, so, you know, I think that you do need a keeper of the vision and somebody who is constantly phrasing it in a way that, you know, really gets your, your the people you work with excited and on board and they understand why this thing you're gonna be slaving over for the next couple of years of your life is so important and, and why you need to get through these challenges and they communicate to customers and they communicate to investors. I think that's super important and I think you take input from everybody but I think at the end of the day, one person's responsible for it. Um, and so I think you have better success when you've got a visionary up top. And I think the natural cycle of business too, by the way, is you start with a visionary, somebody who's so consumed and obsessed and can articulate their idea particularly well that they can take you know, go from nothing to something. And then, you know, well, let's take Apple as an example, and I, I can pick on them um, because I give them all their money anyway, so. But like, you know, Steve Jobs, like clearly had just like, super opinionated guy, like, you know, decided to make the iPad because some Microsoft engineer like offhandedly said, yeah, we're thinking about making a tablet and it's gonna have a pen. And he's like, that's stupid, right? I can do that, I can do it better, right? And just drove that. 
And so I think you know you've seen sort of the the the, the like amazing impact that company's had. Maybe you're an Android person, it doesn't matter, but like they've done a lot, right? And he's gone now, and you know, the question is, do you want the whole organization sort of just doing their own thing and slowly drifting apart from one another, or do you hope that a Tim Cook or a Johnny Ives steps up and, and is the next keeper of the vision? And maybe it's a different vision, right? But I, I would always vote for keeper of the vision. And I do think when you get large enough, you start to diffuse and, you know, oh well, right? But uh, My second question was, for businesses that have an, um, that are looking to hire people for the first time, is it important to have an office space uh, right in the beginning, or do you, should you give your employees the freedom to work on their own time? Um, so I think developing a culture is the important part. Developing a team and a culture. Uh, there are folks who can achieve that remotely and you know with disparate hours. I would argue that's much much harder. Right, so like one of my favorite little, I would say little, but I can say little. If they're listening, they'll be offended. Like Buffer, you can follow the Buffer guys. They're very vocal on social media and content. They make an app where you can like queue up tweets and Facebook posts, and they'll choose the right time. And you know, it's 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 pretty simple but obvious value. And these guys work fully remote. Like they've got people on every different continent and every different time zone, and they come together in a video chat. And they're very vocal about how they run a distributed team. And you can actually see how hard it is. Like it's hard enough to get a culture in the first place, but to maintain a culture distributed or at you know, different times and people aren't in the same room, I think that's challenging. If you have the luxury of getting an office space or just always meeting in the same room, I would go for that more often than not. But if you're just getting started and you don't have cash and some smart person you're gonna work with is somewhere else, just really make sure you're over investing in communicating and sharing the vision because I think people chronically underestimate uh, or they overestimate how much alignment they have with their team. They're like, yeah, everybody knows what we're doing, right? And I'll talk to the other guy and he'll just tell me some other vision. And I'm like, whoa, like, mm, no, you didn't. You need to like, you guys need to have more conversations. Like, that's important. So I, I would err on being together. So in your opinion, what are some of the most important things you can keep in mind leading up to, during, and after a product launch? And can you talk about that through the scope of working at Runkeeper if you were there? During the product launch. Yeah, I actually came in after they had done done the first product launch to iPhone. Um, so this was when they were scaling. They had a couple hundred thousand users. By the time I left, they had millions. Um, you know, I think the Runkeeper experience. I would say this is like build a good product that provides real value and time to market extremely well. Like they came out right when the App Store came out, right? And like Jason knew this was going to happen. So what? You know, I'm not saying he was like dumb lucky. Like he, he had a vision and. He knew that phones had GPS, and he knew there would eventually be an app store, and he built his app, and you know, boom, very smart. Um, but if you time, if you time a, a, the rise of a platform, like you, like you can have no better product than that, right? So this is why there's so many like incredible. When the PC came out, Microsoft, you know, when the internet came out, you know, well, you've had a lot of winners and losers, but you know, the Googles and the Facebooks and all that, right? Like they wrote a platform. Um, so if you can do that, great. But I would say that the common advice you get is totally true, which is if you're proud of what you're shipping, you ship too late, completely buy that. Uh, the number one mistake you'll see, and, and hopefully you'll practice and feel, and I've done it, I, I still do it, is you will spend too much time uh, you know, polishing a turd, and you don't know that because you haven't shown it to anybody yet. Right? You don't know your baby's ugly. Um, <laughs> it will be ugly, it will be very ugly. And so getting, you know, there are two things I'd recommend is one is get it out there earlier than later, get users. The things that you're focused on are like, you know your business and you know your product and you know your market probably better than most people. So you'll be focused on these like really critical little nuances that are gonna make or tank your value prop when your customers can't figure out how to like sign up, right? And you'll, you'll, you'll feel that time and time again when you actually start talking to them. So ship sooner rather than later, ship incomplete product. Don't, you know, pretend like the features are there and when it clicks, just have it send you an email saying, hey, someone actually tried to use that and we don't have it yet. Like that, that's, that's good. I'd argue that's really good. You know, ship the vaporware, don't have vaporware. Um, and, you know, obviously you've got to respond and iterate to what people are telling you and just be, I mean, the trick in product is managing feedback less than about building it, right? Like I, I'm convinced if you get reasonably smart developers in a room, you can build just about anything. That's not the hard part anymore. It's figuring out what there is to build. And the other trick is get people to pay you up front, right? Like every 
blow smoke and tell you like, hey, this is great, the baby isn't ugly, and they're like looking the other way, like, yeah, but I wouldn't babysit it, right? So you want to get people to, to actually pay you uh, as soon as possible, because that is fundamentally the signal that matters, is how do you package enough value that people will transact? But you probably already knew all that, like it's just driving the point home. Any questions from the middle? We've had no middle people, oh, wow. Good. I find the more offensive I get, the more questions there are, so. Um, what uh, was your favorite deal that you did at VC?